Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to do my thing. Okay. Is that going to work for you, or does it I think come so. back? Is it aiming kind of like my mouth? Yep. So it should be all right. All right. Does it come back forward down there? No, it's, it's working for you. Yeah. Yeah. Trying a different microphone and without wires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, the variety of uh, the lapel uh, units that sometimes didn't work for us. They didn't seem to transmit far enough or a different thing. So now we're trying it this way as well. We had one time we had music coming through the wires that were trying to go across the room here. <laughs> uh, Anyway, the topic for today is the next in the long line of things that I had planned on speaking on. And this one happens to be about the clean and unclean animals in the Bible. Just the next one I was doing. And uh, with the topic of uh, clean and unclean animals, you have to have a broad thinking on it as to when did it start and when does it go into the New Testament? How does it fit in the New Testament? Are there objections to it? And uh, are there this and that uh, versus of difficulty? And um, it's too big to cover all at one time <laughs> for today's sermon. I don't want to get into all of that. So that's where it comes where you have uh, Bible studies in home or here at the church, uh, Bible studies and our Wednesday night. We're doing very well with uh, the Wednesday night ideas and topics. So uh, one thing to remember is that this law of the clean and unclean animals is, uh, uh, is started, is mentioned and talked about well before Moses. It wasn't his fault. <laughs> it was well before him. But he, uh, he was the one that wrote the first five books of the Bible. But he's telling the history, and some of it was oral history. Some was God given to him direct. Uh, so that he would be able to tell those things um, that were before his time. Uh, in the New Testament, there's verses there that need to be uh, explained and discussed and understood kind of differently. There's one major one that I'll get to today. But there's uh, things like we used to have booklets uh, that were available. This one's called Biblical Counsel on Man's Food. Uh, have you considered thinking about the topic of what we eat, what we put into our body, what, what damage it can do, other problems, and uh, of course uh, meat is one that comes up all the time because uh, that's uh, a mainstay of the past. I mean, if you eat potatoes, they can do damage to you, but we're talking about meat, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, potatoes have uh, sugar, they turn uh, starch to sugar, don't they, and sometimes that gets us in trouble. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> But today uh, we want to think on the meat side of it. And meats can be very dangerous to us as well, depending on how they've grown, where they're grown, what type of food they are, um, how they came to be in the food chain, where their position is in the food chain. Uh, and God gave us guidance for our good. He gave us laws for our good. And we can stay out of a lot of trouble, a lot of health, a lot of doctor problems, uh, if we obey God's rules. And uh, that's, there's uh, so much wide open to us. I was talking to somebody recently, and we named a couple of the meats, and they said, but we're allowed, you know, deer and elk and moose and <laughs> um, goat meat and sheep meat and so on that we, may be too expensive for most of us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, we're allowed a lot of foods besides beef and chicken and fish and of course, there's quite a few fish in the ocean that we can eat, and salmon is my favorite, but uh, in the lakes here in Oklahoma too, and the perch and crappie and bass and so on, um, you know, there's lots of food to eat. We don't have to take questionable ones or trouble ones that will give us trouble. So this little booklet is actually out of print by about 30 years. It's out of print by about 30 years. So I can't just say, I've got a handful of these that you can take home with you. But uh, I think it needs to be redone. I notice there's no copyright marks in it. There's no date marks in this one. And so uh, it probably can be easily modified or uh, adapted and uh, made available to all of us. So the statement of faith on this one, I've got a clip on this. I'm going to free this front page and then I can read the statement. 
Um, this statement says the distinct this distinction between clean and unclean meats with re respect to foods is to be observed today as God's will because it is God given for man's benefit. It's for our good, for our benefit. So we need to know this topic. In fact, I wanted to take this one page to the back of this too because it goes on to the next page with some texts that I want to get to. Uh, the uh, first thing I want to talk about is uh, back in Genesis. So where did all this start? Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. It's always good to begin at the beginning. <laughs> go back to the very beginning. In Genesis 1, God was creating the various things and what he did on the first day uh, first he created light and last night when I was thinking about this I thought you know there's a whole lot there that's not told why was this a whole day full of creating light light is frequencies and nowadays we use frequencies in everything from the camera to the microphone to music and instruments and so on um, cell phones you know man the frequencies are all over the place and that's part of what he created on the first day, because he created light. If you use a prism and break light apart, you end up with a rainbow of effect, right? All the various frequencies cause those colors. And isn't it amazing that God created our eyes to be able to receive those frequencies? And our ears to receive those kind of frequencies. And so there was a lot done here on the first day. And then you'd go to the second day and the third day and so on. And uh, the fourth day, on the fourth day, uh, down in verse chapter 1, verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life, and fowls that they may fly above the earth in the firmament of heaven. Firmament was an interesting word, and in part of the story, especially when you come to the flood, the firmament seemed to have had water in it, a lot of water. Actually protected us from a lot of damage, from sunlight and so on. And that's where the water came when the flood came, okay? <laughs> the firmament broke loose and fell on us. Uh, but the firmament also means the area that's blue in our sky. If you go into space and look at all the planets, they're not blue. You look at the Earth and they have a blue cover because of that light that's in the, uh, in the atmosphere, in the firmament. We have a blue sky. If you're on the moon, it's a black sky. If you're on Mars, it's a black sky. And so uh, this is fantastic that God did this. And then the birds can fly in this area and we call it heaven. You know, heaven. But that's not all there is to heaven because God controls everything way, way, way away from here, okay? So uh, we have a heaven where the birds fly, or a firmament where the birds fly, and there's things much higher than that where the atmosphere still has oxygen in it, but not enough to survive. You know, we can fly airplanes up there. Above 10,000 feet, you kind of get woozy after a while, and small airplanes without oxygen, they're only allowed to go 10,000 feet. But the airlines, 30,000 feet, no problem, right? 35,000, 40,000, no problem. Uh, many of the fighter planes go way higher than that, and our clouds even go up to 50,000 feet. They couldn't do that if there was no atmosphere, no, no uh, moisture in the air up there. The clouds wouldn't go that high. So um, the clouds are up there, and then above that we've got the satellites and so on, okay? But God created everything that's flying in the air and everything that's in the water here on the fourth day. Verse 21 says, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. When we're studying the study of what we can eat and what we can't eat, you run across this, God said it was good. He created something perfect. 
something that was very good. The design of the animal, the design of the way that they body, their bodies work, their system of their body works, is great, is good. But for what purpose? Now that's a different story. Why have a grizzly bear? Why have a black bear? Uh, they've got trichinosis. You better not eat it. I had a brother-in-law that had a relative that died because a trichinosis worm crawled through his heart and killed him. Uh, I mean, there's animals that have all sorts of makeup that is good for them. A pig can have 150 diseases in, diseases in his body and no problems. His immune system, his body uh, cleansing of itself, is able to handle that, no problem. Do we want 150 diseases in our body? Uh, maybe we ought to think twice on that one, okay? <laughs> uh, you can go down the list on all of the animals from a clam uh, that can purify water. They show experiments where they have uh, polluted water in two containers. They put clams or something similar to clams uh, in the one bottle and it clears them up in just no time at all because that's what God made them to do. That's their job. He designed them right. But should we eat them? Don't think so. Uh, in uh, British Columbia, there was a city there not far from, from our home and where the church was. They dumped raw sewage into the Fraser River. Back in those days, it was allowed. And there was a certain kind of fish that loved to live there, and they grew really big. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't eat that one. <laughs> So, uh, um, the, there's animals that have their job to do, that God gave them to do, and they're doing it good, they're doing it right, to purifying our, our water system and purifying the land. If you buy an aquarium and you want to see the fish floating around in there and swimming around, you'll buy a, a little animal, if I can think of his name quick, um, snail, that has kind of a foot type thing that they go onto the glass, hang onto the glass, and then they just crawl all over the place. They eat out all the algae, so that you don't have to change the water. <laughs> but God made them perfect. Uh, I don't think we should eat them. Now if you're in France, that would be a delicacy. They don't have a fork for you to put into the shell and turn around and pull it out. And <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, so God made these animals, the, the fowl, actually we could talk about the birds that fly too. There's vultures that are clean, clean up guys, they're garbage collectors, right? Uh, they eat all sorts of things. So God gave the, gave the made animals uh, of various types. So verse 22, uh, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas, and let the fowls multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. That was a, a completion of the work that was done on the fifth day. Night coming first, and then the daylight. So that's why your days are measured from sundown, when the night starts, to sunrise and sunset again is the 24 hours away. So the evening first, then the daylight. The evening and the morning were the first day. Okay. Then uh, in verse 24 starts the sixth day, and God said, let the earth, be, uh, earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth of all kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind, uh, everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, God's, and God saw that it was good. So when he made the uh, beef cattle and the deer and the elk and the moose and so on, uh, and then he went back and he made uh, other kinds of animals, even creeping things upon the earth, uh, he was making them all by their own pattern and after their kind. So if you have a pig in, in our world, and you have the wild boar type of pig, and now they have the little pot-bellied pig, I guess they call it or something, and you can have them in your home. I can't imagine that, but <laughs> it's of 
after their kind. They look similar, and so they're not the same breed at all, but they're similar. Um, you could go through wolves and dogs and you know all kinds of things. You could go through horses and all kinds of horses, and a zebra looks like a horse, but it actually cannot be domesticated. Very interesting. You'd think, oh, no problem. Uh, a zebra could be useful for mankind to plow fields or whatever, you know, you, you need riding and so on. They actually cannot be domesticated. Strange. Because the regular horse that we know is very useful to mankind and very friendly and easy to care for and so on. Now what about eating them? Well now that's a different story. <laughs> Okay, and we'll get to them, some of that here. But they all were made perfect for the job that they were to do, or whether they help mankind, uh, and they have their duty to do. Okay, so let's uh, go to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. This is the story of Noah and the flood. And if we go to, uh, well, verse 1 through 3 will we'll get us going here. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. This is when he made the big ark that was going to float and all the animals in it. It was not a boat. By the way, this is really interesting if you got mathematics in your mind. If you have a boat shaped, it'll rock. It'll buck through the waves. Uh, we saw some nice video on uh, the uh, fireboats and uh, coastal coast guard ships and so on, bucking the waves and driving through the waves and riding up the waves and riding down the waves and so on. Uh, you'd get all these animals sick that are going to go in this ark, right? They'd all be bashed around inside of there. This ark was a box. Certain sizes are given here. It's going to be this wide and this tall and it's going to be that long. It's like a log. And it floats in the water flat. The waves will go by it and it plows its way through kind of level. It doesn't rock because the bottom is flat. Interesting. <laughs> Check it out. Look for the sizes of the box. and They've actually got replicas of it being made in various cities and places so you can actually go and see these uh, arts. Okay, uh, so come into the ark for thee. Have I seen righteousness before me in this generation? He was the few, the very, very few that were righteous. And his family. So he had three sons, the wives, and his, Noah and his wife. And there wasn't other righteous people. Now, take that thought and go to the New Testament, and Jesus said, like it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be when he returns. So there going to be millions to greet him? I don't think so. Because in Noah's time, there was only eight that got on the ark. Okay, just a good thought there to keep in mind when you go to the New Testament. In verse 2, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, of every clean beast shalt thou take unto thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. All of a sudden you have this dividing, some that are called clean and some that are not clean. You took so many of this one and so many of that one, but not the same. There was a distinction between clean and unclean beasts. And verse 3 starts uh, with the fowl. And of the fowl of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. So God wasn't going to recreate all of these animals and things that he'd done. He made them perfect to start with. Why would he just throw them away and start over? So he said, I want you to take these many animals. Now, Noah didn't go around picking them all up. Otherwise, we could blame them for chiggers and fleas and <laughs> mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, they all had a job to do, right? God made them all. And uh, uh, he took, they came to him, actually. When you're reading the story, they came to him and they went on the ark. So maybe a deer came along with a tick and a 
you know, dog came along with a flea and so on. Uh, but they all got on board. And, uh, but the distinction is here between clean and unclean a long time before Moses, because here only eight people were going to survive through this. Okay, um, it tells all about Noah's life and, and the animals and so on that were on the ark and, and how they were complete on there. So uh, what we see here is that all of the animals were there uh, well before the time of, uh, of Noah even, because this was the distinction given at his time. So go with me to uh, Leviticus 11. This is a description of the animals. Leviticus 11. And you're going to have to do some reading at home here for sure. I know you probably wanted to know more about Noah as well. And the animals there. But uh, time won't permit. So Leviticus 11 is the story of the animals. And which ones we are allowed to eat and not eat. It's very interesting here that there's, uh, in verses 2 through 8, there's land animals. From verse 9 to 12 is water animals. From verse 13 to 20 is the fowls of the air. And uh, then 21 to 28 is general uh, rules of uh, food and animals. And 29 through 47 is actually more general rules with those animals. And uh, there's some special words at the end, 44 to 47. So you really need all of these verses. And there's special pieces here and there in between. Uh, I couldn't possibly hit them all. But what you should be looking for is that at least 10 times in this one chapter, the word abomination is used. 10 times in this one chapter. Um, there's also unclean is stated 31 times in this one chapter. 31 times. This means God really wanted us to get the message while we're here. Abomination means something that God cannot stand. And he wants you to stay away from it. Sin, God can't put up with. Abomination, God can't put up with. Sin and abomination are hand in hand, right? So we need to be well aware of what's in this chapter. It describes what we can eat and what not eat. So in chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Unto the children of Israel say, These are the beasts with which ye shall eat among all of the beasts that are on the earth. And then he starts to dis describe it. If they've got a hoof, in verse 3, for whatsoever part of the hoof, like the cow's foot, the pig's foot is divided, you know, certain other animals, moose, elk, deer, you know, so on, they have a divided hoof. But the horse does not. The horse has a full hoof. So that's a different animal here as well then. So that if you were going to eat it, you would need to part the hoof and be cloven-footed, two parts, not multiple parts, but two parts to the foot. And chew the cud. Oh, that leaves the horse out. They don't chew the cud. Now the rabbit does chew the cud, but it's got a paw, so that's a different, that won't work, okay? It has to have both, the, the hoof and chew the cud. Now chewing the cud on some of them is gross, okay? You want to know about that, but it's good enough to know if he's got a paw, let's leave him alone. Let's not eat that one, okay? Um, so in the last part of the verse, among the beasts that he shall eat. So you're looking for those two items. <clears throat> uh, and the, the deer chews the cud, the elk and the moose and, and so on, they, they chew the cud as well. But a camel, it's, it says there in verse uh, 4, um, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, so that's one mark in his favor, but divideth not the hoof, he's got a paw type foot, so you, you can't eat him. And he is unclean unto you. And then the coney, which is similar to a rabbit, but it's a rock type uh, animal, uh, lives in the, in the rocks. And he divides not the hoof and is unclean unto you. And it goes on explaining at one after the other. So if you're looking at the bigger animals, you're saying, okay, uh, a dog, oh, he's got a paw. 
and he doesn't chew the cud. You can't eat dogs. A cat, you can't eat a cat because he's got a paw. Doesn't chew the cud. You, know, you can go down the list of food and just say, leave off those. You know, beef is fine. I think they'll stay with that. And the, the um, goat and sheep, you know, they're okay. They chew the cud and they've got the divided hoof. So you can go down the list pretty easy. So then you want to go on to the next group in verse 9, starts the ones for the water. And the first thing it says, uh, I'll just read a bit. These shall ye eat of all that are in the water, whatsoever have fins and scales in the water and in the seas and in the rivers ye shall eat. So when it comes to a fish, you're looking for fins and scales. Okay, well, I'm sorry the catfish is out. It's got a slick skin. Whales have slick skins. Sharks have thick, slick skins. Uh, you know, so you're looking at the, the bass and the uh, uh, perch and, and some of those. Uh, salmon is a good choice. So it, it's easy to look at the fish or to get a look on, now you can look on, on internet and Google it and so on and find out whether that item has fins and scales <coughs> for the animals in the water. Um, the uh, things like uh, Crabs and lobsters and oysters and you know, whatever, uh, seafoods are not acceptable. No fins and no scales. Okay. <laughs> then next is to go to the birds, and it names a lot of them, like the eagle and, and so on are named. The vulture is named that you, you shouldn't eat these. The owls you shouldn't eat and so on. Um, <laughs> an, an easy way to look at some of them, God gave quail to the children of Israel when they were in the desert. Oh, quail are all right. Okay. So you can look at these animals and you can decide this one is not acceptable, that's acceptable. Chicken is acceptable, a grouse is acceptable, pheasant is acceptable. Uh, you know, you can go down through a list like that and, and pick up. Other ones are an abomination unto him. That abomination starts pretty early in the chapter here, verse 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, 13 the second time, and 20 I see, and so on. It just the abomination is just here and here and here and here that these things are not acceptable to, to the Heavenly Father. So I know I need to move along fairly quickly, so let's jump over to, if you want to read that whole chapter, it's, it's really good all the way down, but I uh, just couldn't possibly uh, include all of it. But Deuteronomy, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14. And we can start with verse 3 here. Uh, just above it, he says, uh, you're a peculiar people unto himself. Well, we are. New Testament says that too. Uh, thou shalt not eat, in verse 3, thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. If it's good, uh, good enough or whatever you could say, I'll microwave it, I'll kill everything, you know, um, but it's still an abominable thing. You are not to take that into your body or to make some offense with it before God. Verse 4 says, These are the beasts which ye shall eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, and he goes on, the, the hart, which is a deer, the roebuck, which is a type of deer, the fallow deer, which is a type of deer, you know, after his cut, okay? Uh, so they go on down through things that you can eat, and the chewing of the cud and the dividing hoof is here again, and the swine says he divides the hoof, but does uh, not chew the cud, so you're not to eat him. Uh, it's called swine or pork, or, you know, we can go, we go to some people and we uh, make some mention, well, we, we don't want any pork in this, and they don't know what you're talking about. They say, well, we'll put some bacon in. Well, sorry, that comes from pork. It comes from swine, as the Bible calls it. Uh, and uh, the, Lard, some people didn't realize that lard came from pork and, and so on. So sometimes there's a little clarifications have to be made that uh, tell about it. And then this chapter goes on to talk about fins and scales and clean birds and so on and names them again. Um, very good verse to go into, or types here to go through. So uh, four and five, the, the types are named in uh, verse six through eight. It talks about, again, the hoof and the clean, uh, clean chewing of the cud. And uh, 9 through 10 is fish. And the birds are 11 through 20. So let's 
jump ahead. We've, we've got a goal. You might want to just write that this place down and come back to it and read it in full and careful. But I want to get to the New Testament. So let's go to Acts chapter 10. This is one of the famous verses that people want to use to say, I can eat anything that I can put in my mouth. This is one of them. Well, we want to start with verse 1, but again, skimming fairly quickly. In uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band of the Italian band. He was a Gentile. And the Jewish people thought he could eat anything he wanted, I guess. And, and he was coming to faith. He was coming to understanding of the Bible. And he was doing the best he knew how, because verse says, 2 says he was a devout man, one that feared God and all his house and gave alms, and so he prayed always. Uh, and he had a vision. God doesn't give visions to bad people. I suppose he could scare them so that they would maybe turn their heart from evil. <laughs> but uh, this was a good vision that he was having about calling for somebody to come and pray with him and teach him something. And when he got the idea of what was going on, he got his men ready to go. And he said he, they were supposed to go to Joppa in, ver, Joppa in verse 5 to Simon, one whose surname was Peter. This is the regular Peter of our Bible. And go there and ask him, because he's a tanner, you know, there's, what was his job? What was he doing? So that they would be able to identify when, when they got here to Peter's house. And they're going to start traveling. Pardon? Simon? Simon's house. Okay, sorry. Uh, Simon the Tanner. And, uh, and Peter was there in, in Joplin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Cornelius sent him. Well, at the same time, God is working from the other end as well. I'm going to bring these two things together. So Peter went on top of the house, and, and this sounds kind of funny if you've got a pitched roof, but they didn't. They had flat roofs. <laughs> they could put a tub of water up there and, and warm it in the sunlight and have it a bath and so on, that's how they, they did their water system, would be easy. Could also have a slight, small pipe or, or funnel type thing out of it, and you could be showering down below or uh, use it for laundry or whatever. Um, but they had a flat roof. So he was up on the house top, and in verse 10 it says he got into a trance, or actually a vision again, and he saw the heaven opened, in verse 11, and saw a heaven opened, and a certain vessel uh, descending unto him, as as it were as it had been a great sheet net in the four corners. I'm thinking ahead, and if you take four corners of a handkerchief and hold them together, and you can put things into that handkerchief. Well, that's that's what was going on here. It was a big sheet. The four corners were held together, knit together, uh, tied together, or whatever. And something was in there. Well. As you go down, there was, verse 12 says there was all manners of four-footed beasts in there, all manner together. Uh, everything, wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air even were in there. And this came down to Peter and the voice said, kill and eat. Oh, really, Lord? You're changing things here, aren't you? So he said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. Common was just touching the other animal. You couldn't eat that animal. He was defiled. They, they, they just despised some animal. So you, if they, if so, some clean animal touched that, oh boy, they'd never eat it. Uh, so they wouldn't have that in, uh, in uh, an edible way. Wouldn't accept it. And uh, the voice said again, uh, what I have cleaned, call all not common. And it's happened three times, trying to get the point across to Peter. You can, you can eat all of this, supposedly, right? And Peter's saying, oh, no, Lord, what, what's going on here? I don't understand this at all. So Peter was doubting in his vision, in verse 17, and these men came from Cornelius to his house and stood at the gate, and they asked for permission to talk to, to Peter. And then in verse 19, he uh, starts talking with them because he's getting a picture. Now what's interesting is back in verse 7 there was three men. In verse 19 there's three men. And there was another one here somewhere. That saw that there was three, three and three and three. Oh, and the three times the, the, the cloth was lowered. And wow, there's threes here that we should consider what's happening. 
Any, anyway, the men from Cornelius told him what they were there for and that he was supposed to come with them and go to them to help Cornelius understand, and his whole household, to understand things that were being done in spiritual matters. And Peter thought for himself for a while, and he said, okay, I'll go with you. Because he was getting a little picture from his vision. And what these guys showed up immediately after he has the vision. So he says, okay, I'll go with you. And verse 24, in the morrow after they entered into uh, Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. There's going to be a revival going on here. <laughs> he called together the people. And uh, Peter coming into Cornelius met him, and Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet to worship him. He was so devout that he knew that he was going to gain something from Peter. And so he's going to kneel to him and pray to him like worship him. And verse 26, and Peter took him up and saying, stand up, I myself am a man. Don't, don't worship me like I'm something special. You know, I'm just a man. Don't, don't do that. And uh, 28, and he said unto them, ye know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come in into a, another nation, one of another nation. But God hath shown me, ah, where did you get that idea? God hath shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The vision that Peter saw of these animals was not meant for eating. It was an example of people. The Jews were so separate that they wouldn't give water to anybody. They wouldn't even talk to them. You have to remember when Jesus talked to the lady at the well and so on. Uh, this was very unusual that this should ever happen with the Jewish culture, the Jewish way. So he, he said, no, I, I'm not allowed to do this. You know how it's, uh, it's wrongful, un, unlawful for a Jew to even meet the person, talk with them, let alone go in their house, and you sure, certainly would not eat with them. How did he get the idea that he was allowed to in this case? Because he said, God hath shown me that I should not call any man of any nation common or unclean. The story was not about food. The story is about people. So God was fixing this thought in his mind that he would be able to do that later. The gospel was to go to Judea, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Right? All peoples are accepted. So God was giving Peter this vision and getting him the right idea here that he could go on and spread the gospel. So this is uh, important to read this again and, and see what happened at the house, what went on with, with Cornelius. And uh, Peter was so pleased that in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable with him. So you can see how this major story that is thought to be about food, and meat particularly, had nothing to do with meat. It was to do with people and how we regard one another from one nation to another nation. Okay, so fairly quickly here now, I want to go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66, just a couple more verses. Uh, I did not put my little papers in today, which helps me. <laughs> but I knew there wasn't very many verses. So Isaiah, it's just before Jeremiah, and verse 66 is the last chapter. Yes, last chapter. And I want to go to verse 15. Isaiah 66, verse 15. But behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like whirlwinds, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. 
So we know that this is the end time prophecies, even if you look at the top of the chapters, it'll say that the future uh, is being prophesied. Verse 17 now. They that sanctify themselves, we know that that's a wrong deal, and purify themselves in the gardens, behind the tree in the midst, that was wrong with groves and things like that, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. If they're going to eat the unclean animals, they're in big trouble. You could read more here. And you'd see that it is talking about end time effects and events. So this this rule of the clean and unclean extends way into the future, right till the end of the world. Uh, look also in chapter 65 here, Isaiah 65 and verse 4. 65 verse 4. Um, verse 3 talks about the people that were doing wrong things. The people that provoke me to anger continually to my face and sanctify in gardens and burneth incense of altars of brick. They were not. They were not supposed to cut the stones even. They were place stones together, but don't cut them. Don't use tools. And here they're using bricks. They're just making God angry. Um, and remain among the graves and lodge in the mountains, monuments, um, shall eat, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels. And they say, I'm holier than thou, you know, I'm doing this as a religious thing. Uh, again, very wrong thing to do. And this is talking about the future. So why don't we look at Revelation chapter 18? That's the end of the world. See if the animals are still there, if this law is still in effect in these end time verses. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. I'm supposed to come out of there. And the whole of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. These unclean are still there in the end of the world. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. They bring the food from everywhere, don't they? And the jewels and the gold and so on, the money system. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. We need to be different. We need to be clean people, using clean foods, doing spiritually clean things, being righteous, being holy even, being peculiar people, zealous of good works. Uh, we are not to make ourselves abominable to God. That's in Isaiah 66, verse 17. Uh, there in the middle of the verse. And of course in Revelations. Uh, let me let me do, do those quickly. I had an Isaiah here just a moment ago. Um, Isaiah 66. And in the middle of the 17th verse, um, and they were eating swine's flesh and the abomin abomination, whatever that was, don't do it. So what about that chapter 11 that has it 10 times in it, the word abomination? You need to stay away from those things because it's going to bring trouble and uh, dislike from the Heavenly Father. And then Revelation 21, I kept my finger in it, I should have told you, <laughs> to keep your finger in Revelation. But Revelation 21 and verse 8, these are those that are not going to have God's favor or won't be in the kingdom. And when the New Jerusalem comes down and so on, the second verse is the New Jerusalem coming down. And verse 8 says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, we should not make ourselves abominable because it will not get us into the kingdom of God. 
And so the abominable and the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars shall have their part in the lake, it, lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. So we need to avoid these things because we want to do what's right and we want to be in God's forever. May God bless you.